We've been so betrayed. We have been so terribly betrayed. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. That's the voice of the Reverend Jim Jones at the People's Temple in Jonestown, Guyana, South America. It's November 18th, 1978. Jones is pressuring his followers to drink a poisonous concoction he says will end their suffering on this earth. By day's end, 918 people will be dead. It was the single largest killing of American civilians until 9-11. Those of you who know of the event might think you know what happened. Crazed cultists following their leader kill themselves. We're going to challenge that. This is Oversight, CQ Roll Call's new podcast where we re-examine our nation's scandals through the prism of congressional investigation. We're doing this at a moment when congressional oversight is again gripping the nation. I'm Sheila McVicker. And this is a story about what happens when oversight fails. In this first season, Jonestown, we dig deep into the tragic events that took place at the People's Temple Commune, including the assassination of Congressman Leo Ryan. Jonestown is a horrifying story. How the leader of the People's Temple, the Reverend Jim Jones, for decades escaped accountability, evaded law enforcement, and essentially held his flock hostage. At its core, Jonestown is a story about what happens when government officials don't do their jobs. We explore the investigations around Jonestown, looking at what was uncovered, what was missed, and what that means for today. This journey spans six episodes. We have new information and a new understanding of how one man was able to bring 917 other people to their deaths. It's complicated, and it's compelling. It's also disturbing and not suitable for all listeners. Let's begin in South America, in Guyana, in the deep jungle, at the People's Temple Agricultural Collective, Jonestown. Carved out of the jungle so remote the only real way to get there was by plane, and then it was seven miles up a muddy track from the nearest village. It was primitive, but I was proud of it. That's Leslie Wagner Wilson. She's one of the few who escaped death at Jonestown. I mean, we didn't have running water for toilets. We took cold showers. But I was proud when I saw what we had done there, that we had, you know, open this whole area of jungle up and there were homes, you know, there were cabins and there was a kitchen and there was a, you know, a huge outhouse. And I was just impressed by what we had done. There was electricity. And so I felt that euphoria for a while. Here's another survivor, Dale Parks. The sadness is what he did build in the middle of that Amazon jungle was, was in some ways remarkable. But what it turned into was an absolute nightmare. The People's Temple leader, Jim Jones, sold Jonestown as a refuge, a place of racial and social equality in a tropical paradise. The residents were mostly transplanted Americans, 70% African Americans, many of them senior citizens, and almost all from California. Remember, this was the 1970s, a moment of cultural change, and those who joined the temple were looking to belong to something bigger than themselves. In the vision of the eloquent and charismatic Jones, many believed they had found their place. As with almost everything about Jim Jones, there was a more sinister side to Jonestown. Some followers went willingly. Others were coerced. The sign on the gate said, Greetings. Another inside warned, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. But I started really seeing Jonestown for what it was, but I was also scared, right? Because we're stuck. You know, when I realized that there was no way out, 
that's a horrible feeling. No way out. For Jim Jones, the remote location surrounded by jungle was as effective as any prison barbed wire. It was his kingdom, his rules, his secrets kept, passports checked at the door. None of the beatings, forced labor, or sexual abuse was apparent to outsiders, including those from the U.S. State Department. American diplomats based in Guyana's capital were charged with dealing with Americans abroad. They visited Jonestown as part of their jobs. They didn't notice the mind control, the fear, or the punishments. We're talking about this now, as the role of the State Department is pivotal. We'll get to that later. This organization is built upon the dictatorship of the proletariat, and I am, goddammit, very much in control. The one way I can ease my attention is to raise my voice and my level of anger. Just months after arriving in Guyana, the Reverend Jones, once a powerful political player in California with powerful friends and a more powerful PR machine, was losing himself in the grips of his own paranoia. I'll raise that level of anger, invoke martial law, and see, goddammit, that we get some consistency in this son of a bitch in place. Do you read me? And so that fear was constant, especially as Jim got worse. It, you know, running through the running through the pavilion to the pavilion in the middle of the night because he's calling, you know, that we're being attacked. It was strategic, right? Mentally, physically, emotionally. Drained. Drained. Fake attackers. Mercenaries prepared to kidnap children, enemies all around, a sense of siege. Jones even devised a loyalty test. At Jonestown, it was called a white knight, a challenge to drink fruit punch that might or might not have been poisoned. To drink, that proved your loyalty and love for Jones. Again, Dale Parks. And you knew exactly what white knight meant. That was his code word for the mass murder, ritual, suicide. Um, And he would rehearse by doing the bitter Kool-Aid, but no cyanide in it. It was a total lie. It was the abuse. It was, you son of a bitch. You know, how can you do this to people? It was fear for my own life. Life in Jonestown was falling apart. Back in the U.S., relatives began to worry, fearing for family members isolated and out of touch, some even claiming their loved ones in Jonestown were physically prevented from leaving the commune. They wrote letters to the State Department. Some even wrote to the FBI. One talked to the vice president's advisors. And one by one, they began contacting their California congressman, Representative Leo Ryan. He had a reputation as an activist, a politician who wanted to see things for himself. Here's Jackie Speer, then as legislative aide, now a congresswoman. And there were constituents of his who had loved ones, young adults, who had gotten involved in the People's Temple, and they were concerned about their well-being. Ryan spent hours listening to family members and the few whistleblowers, former members of the People's Temple who claimed they were risking their lives by speaking out. People like Debbie Layton Blakey, once part of Jones's inner circle. Let's listen to what she told the congressman. Did you have any trouble leaving? Um, it's a long story. Well, Debbie Layton Blakey's story is central to the question of oversight and responsibility. It turns on information she gave State Department officials and others six months before the final day, raising real questions about what was happening in Jonestown and what was and wasn't being done with that information. We'll explore this in a later episode. But first, here's Congressman Leo Ryan probing Leighton Blakey's story. Let's suppose that I went down there to Guyana, to Jonestown, and said, if anybody wants to leave, They can leave with me right now. And I will stay here until everyone who wants to leave has found a way to get out and will provide some kind of transportation. What would the result be? 
I don't think anybody would play with you. Leighton Blakey tells Ryan, I don't think anybody would leave with you. Ryan makes the point that, well, doesn't that prove that Jim Jones isn't a bad guy at all? Leighton Blakey's response? No. Because people are so terrified. What Congressman Ryan hears is pretty alarming. Horror stories, tales of abuse, physical punishment, weapons. He even hears about the White Knights, the suicide drills. Ryan decides he needs to further investigate. He talks to the State Department. American diplomats point out all the obstacles to a visit to Jonestown. They emphasize how difficult it is to get to Jonestown from the capital. They also remind him that People's Temple is private property and that he cannot enter without Jim Jones's permission. He forms an official congressional delegation to go to Jonestown to see for himself. And his legislative aide, Jackie Spear, is going with him. With them are a crew from NBC News, three newspaper reporters, a photographer, and a group of family members hoping to see their loved ones in Jonestown, perhaps even persuade them to leave. The night before they leave? Well, you can hear it from Ryan's daughters, Aaron and Patricia. Did Jackie Spear ever talk to you about her own concerns about going to oh, yeah. Jonestown? Oh, yeah. She wrote a will. And um, so did Dad yeah. the, the day before. Your father wrote yes. a will the day yeah. before? Yeah. yeah. Handwritten. But Ryan also believed that the media traveling with him offered a kind of protection. When they arrive in Guyana, it's still not clear that Jim Jones will agree that Ryan can come to the People's Temple Commune. There's lots of back and forth between the temple, Ryan, his staff, and the U.S. Embassy. Until finally, with a U.S. diplomat, the media, and two of Jones's lawyers in tow, but with no armed guards, they set off for Jonestown. A quick 24-hour visit. Late in the afternoon of Friday, November 17, 1978, they land on the rough strip at Port Kaituma. It was still unclear if Congressman Ryan would be allowed in. Jones's lawyers have been advocating for openness, and finally, Jones gives in. The only transport? A dump truck to churn up the seven muddy miles to Jonestown. Once there... Comes to us from California. He has represented many of us who have lived in his district back in California. And we welcome you, and we'd like for you to say a few words to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. I didn't... I'm not That's Congressman to... Ryan in Jonestown on the last night of his life. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. This is a congressional inquiry. I think that all of you know that I'm here to find out more about uh, questions of the raised about your operation here. But I can tell you right now... I need to stop for a minute to explain these tapes. The People's Temple and Jim Jones obsessively taped everything. His sermons, speeches by guests, musical performances, even his drugged, manic, incoherent rants. In the aftermath, the FBI ended up with a box full of tapes, hundreds of hours of tapes. And we have them because the Jonestown Institute, a repository of documents and original research, filed Freedom of Information Act requests, a lot of them, and got the tapes declassified and released. Back to Friday night. Everything seems to go well. There's a dinner, there are speeches, there's music. Relatives who traveled with Ryan are talking to their family members. Dale Parks, again. There were shows put on, singing put on, um, for Leo Ryan and the and the visitors. I remember seeing, I guess it would have been Jim Cobb talking to his mother and his mother just having this big smile and acting happy and apparently telling him how wonderful it was there and no, she wouldn't leave with him. Ryan is talking to people. The journalists are wandering around. It all seems pretty normal or as normal as Jonestown could seem. 
But the facade is about to crack. At the back of the crowd is one of the journalists, the NBC reporter. A man comes up to him and slips him a piece of paper. On the paper is a note. My friend and I want to leave. Can you help? The reporter pockets the note. Morning, Saturday, November 18th. Well, the community that day, I remember it, the tension so thick you can cut it with a knife. Here's Leslie Wagner Wilson again. It was surreal. It was quiet, but it was frightening. It was, it was, something was stirring, but we didn't know what. I couldn't pinpoint death. I, I couldn't pinpoint that. For weeks, Leslie had been part of a secret group planning to flee Jonestown. I did, we really, you really couldn't trust anyone. I couldn't even trust my own family. She was determined to get out with her three-year-old son. A Jonestown security guard stopped and questioned her. And I said, we're going on a picnic, which is the most ridiculous thing you could ever say, because it wasn't as if you can go into a refrigerator and pull food out, right, and make a sandwich or make a lunch and go on a picnic. And she couldn't even comprehend it. With guards and enforcers distracted by Ryan's continuing visit, Leslie, with 10 others, four of them children, managed to get out through the jungle. In the end, Leslie walked, walked with her son on her back, nearly 30 miles to safety at a Guyanese government police outpost. I couldn't tell you what time we arrived. I know it was dark and we had been on the road um, a while um, while it was still dark. We huddled and we knew we were making a decision and verbalizing it. Like Leslie, Dale Parks and his family, which included his grandmother, had been plotting to find a way out. They'd stashed some food and water in the jungle. But now, as Congressman Ryan, his aide, and the others prepare to wrap up their visit, they see another opportunity to leave. We're going to stand on this, and we may die right here. And in in unity, it was like... Death was better than one more day in Jonestown. Than one more single day of hell on earth. But someone has to get to the Ryan delegation. And my grandmother, debilitated and skinny as hell, running as best she could to try to get to Jackie Spears. Remember, Jackie Spears is Congressman Ryan's aide. Others, I'm told, were running to try to catch her, to keep her from getting to Jackie Spears, but God bless her heart, she made it. And with that, it becomes clear that more people want out. The couple who wrote the note the night before, the Parks family, the Bogues. Jones was sitting on his chair under the pavilion roof, holding court, clearly on drugs. And you can you can see him licking his lips. You can tell it's a dry cotton mouth. You can hear the slurred speech even there visually, but even over that microphone that day, it was really, really, really bad. Congressman Ryan has now got six people who are finished with the People's Commune, plus his aide, the reporters, the TV crew, and the family members to get out of Jonestown. They need a second plane. They ask the U.S. Embassy to help. That shortwave radio, that's the only way Jonestown could communicate with the outside world. A reminder, this is 1978. It's before the internet, before cell phones, before texting. And up at Jonestown, they didn't even have a telephone line. Good morning, guys. It's in now. Yeah, thank you much, sir. Back in Georgetown, Guyana's capital... U.S. Embassy staff relay messages passed by the People's Temple shortwave radio. Okay, thank you very much. Is the ambassador still there? Let me talk to him first. These tapes, made by an embassy official as a kind of memory aid, were first confiscated and classified by the State Department, then declassified, again after being sought under the Freedom of Information Act by the Jonestown Institute. Here, an embassy staffer is talking to the ambassador. Uh, get a hold of uh, Franklin, see what you can do. Huh? I'm trying. I just, I just 
But in Jonestown, by early afternoon, more people are coming forward saying they too want to get out, and there's not enough room on the planes. Dale Parks has a final conversation with Jim Jones before he leaves. And when he hugged us and let us go goodbye in front of the TV cameras, which was not him at all, and I told him in his ear, please, will you please not do anything stupid over this small amount of people that just want to go home not go back and destroy you? Congressman Ryan decides he's staying to make sure all those who want to leave can get out. There's a crowd around the pavilion, people milling about. People are dragging suitcases, saying goodbye. Jones is sitting, sullen. And suddenly, out of the crowd, a guy jumps on Ryan's back with a knife in his hand. He's pulled off. The congressman is not hurt. Now, instead of staying, the congressman heads to the airstrip with the others. Here's Jackie Spear again. Forty people were left in the commune who wanted to leave that never got out because of the knifing attempt on Congressman Ryan. He was actually going to, you know, shepherd the second group out. And yet when the knifing attempt cur- occurred, he was, you know, whisked away and brought down to the dump truck that we were in on our way to the airstrip. Scheduled takeoff was 2 p.m., but the planes, delayed by weather, aren't on the ground. They wait and wait. And as the planes finally arrive, this is when the mayhem starts. Among the group, there's Larry Layton, one of Jones's most trusted operatives. He was just pretending he wanted to leave. And although Congressman Ryan has been frisking people for weapons before they get on the planes, Leighton manages to sneak one on board. He starts shooting, wounds two people, and then points the gun at Dale Parks, who is there with his sister Tracy. He put his put the gun back to my chest, right where my heart is, and pulled the trigger. And the gun exploded, but the bullet got stuck and didn't come out. And I didn't know that until I fought him for the gun with him and I falling out of the airplane. Um, uh, And Tracy took off before without me or I somehow lost track of her during that shit, which I feel just god awful about, of getting the gun away from him. Uh, Pulled it on him, pulled the trigger, and there were no bullets left. I'm looking at video from NBC News of what happens next. These are the last images shot by cameraman Bob Brown. Across the airfield, a Jonestown tractor pulling a trailer comes into frame. And on the trailer, standing, Jones's armed men. They open fire. Dale Parks is talking about what happened to his mother, Patricia. It was like if she left her body early. It was a stray bullet in the wrong seat and the wrong time, and it literally took her brain out of her head like a bowl of jelly and tacks, jello and tacks. They took her off of the plane. Uh, that's when Tracy and I were able, walked up and saw it, saw her and what they did to her and the top of her head blown off. Georgetown, the U.S. Embassy. It's late afternoon. Yeah. Yes, sir, there's something bad going on. I don't know what it is. Joe Hartman called Ogle and he heard something about the planes haven't taken off yet because of gunshots. Patricia Parks is dead. The NBC cameraman and reporter are dead. The San Francisco examiner photographer is dead. And lying next to the wheel of the plane, the body of Congressman Leo Ryan. His aide, Jackie Spear, has been shot five times. 
Back to the U.S. Embassy. That's the embassy staffer talking to the American ambassador again. He's monitoring shortwave traffic between Jonestown and the People's Temple base in the Guyanan capital. Yeah, I should read this to you, but I don't know what it means. A lot of people have seen... Pardon? A lot of people have seen... Mr. Oh. Fraser. A declassified People's Temple codebook recovered by the FBI shows that the phrase... A lot of people have seen Mr. Fraser means that a lot of people have died. That's not where the story of Jonestown ends. How very much I've loved you. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. We know what happens next because we have the tapes. And there were actually people who survived. Jones's lawyers who ran into the jungle, others who managed to hide. Jones has assembled everyone and has told them the moment has come and it's time to die. There's no way to detach ourselves from what's happened today. And we, we are sitting here waiting on a powder keg. One woman, Christine Miller, dares to challenge Jones. As long as his life is hope, that's my faith. Well, some everybody dies. <laughs> Someplace that hope runs out because everybody dies. She shouted down, and then. Red Brigade showed them justice. The congressman's dead. Please get us the medication. It's simple. It's simple. There's no convulsions with it. It's just simple. Just please get it. Before it's too late, the GDF will be here. I tell you, get moving. Get moving. Get moving. The GDF are the Guyanese Defense Forces. The expectation that because of the shootings at the airfield, the Army will eventually show up. And the medication is not medication at all. It's a witch's brew of cyanide and Valium and some children's flavored drink in popular imagination, Kool-Aid. Thus the origin of the expression, don't drink the Kool-Aid. There's nothing to worry about. Everybody keep calm and try and keep your children calm. The first to die, and to be clear, murdered, are babies and children. 304 of them. They're not choosing to take the poison. Please, for God's sakes, let's get on with it. We've lived, we've lived as no other people have lived and loved. We've had as much of this world as you're going to get. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. In the midst of all of this, Jim Jones spiraling people dying, Jones's armed henchmen circling the compound, one of Jones's lieutenants summons a man named Tim Carter. We've spoken to Carter several times, and this is what he told us. He, along with two others, were summoned to the command hut, and there they were given three suitcases full of cash and gold, nearly a million U.S. dollars in cash, and told by any means to get it to the Soviet embassy in Georgetown, along with documents that sign over even more millions of the People's Temple money to the USSR. Carter and the others flee through the jungle. We'll tell you more about this money and the connection to the Soviet Union in later episodes. But for now, the final moments are playing out in Jonestown. No way I'm going to do it. I, I refuse. I don't know who fired the shot. I don't know who killed the congressman. But as far as I'm concerned, I killed him. You understand what bodies I mean? are piled on bodies. Arms linked, face down. The Guyanese pathologist who examined the bodies two days later testified that many bore evidence of forcible injection of the poison, including adults. Many had not chosen death. They were murdered. I was to respect die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. Quickly, quickly, quickly. No more pain, Al. No more pain, I said, Al. No more pain. Jim Jones, though, rather than take the cyanide and suffer the convulsions and suffocation, he shot himself in the head. You've just heard the fateful events of November 18, 1978. But our story 
has just begun. Stay with us as we look at how this happened and ask, could this have been prevented? Coming up, Jim Jones seeks an alliance with the KGB. A magazine backed by Rupert Murdoch takes on Jones. And an exclusive story of corruption within the San Francisco DA's office that enabled Jones to avoid the law. Next stop, California. From religion to revolution. Oversight Jonestown was reported and written by me and Joanne Levine. This episode was produced by Evan Campbell. Editing on the series by Joanne Levine with an assist from Martha Ann Overland. Fact-checking by Noah Berman. Oversight Jonestown could not have happened without the reporting help and insights of our CQ colleagues, Mark Strickerts and Marsha Myers. A huge shout-out to Jillian Roberts for her tireless support. Take a look at our website at rollcall.com forward slash Jonestown, and you'll see a beautiful design by Marnie Prince. It was built by Patrick Blinkhorn, Rajiv Manath, and Tom Schaefer. Oversight is a production of CQ Roll Call.